I need to, uh, with great pleasure, introduce one of my colleagues for the Chi Sung Lecture. Mr. Michael Jenkins is a world-class surgeon in the world-class <laughs> Imperial Vascular Unit. He has been a member of BSET since its inception before many of you were born. Uh, he was past president of BSET, and following that, he went on to be president of the Vascular Society. He's known for his excellence in training, and many of you in this room are a direct product of Mr. Jenkins and his training. He's an excellent, precise operator, doing some of the most complex aneurysm repairs. From a personal, personal point of view, perhaps his most outstanding characteristic, I think, is his analytical, meticulous way of going through cases and other issues that we have in his, on, on the unit. And on top of all of that, he's an excellent doctor. Uh, so all of you all seen him talk all around the world, uh, giving his expert considered views on various topics. <coughs> he has been uh, education, uh, 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 you know, really good in educating the vascular community for many, many years. And there's a long list of lectures that he's given. And to add to that, he now has the Chi Sung lecture to deliver, uh, to us, uh, which I know he's going to do us very proud. So without further ado, Mike, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, Colin, thanks so much. Bijan, um, it, it's an honor and a privilege to give the Chi Sung lecture for 2023 at BSET. And Jeanette, it's lovely to be back at BSET. So Eva, are the glory days over? My disclosures. Many of you in this room will either not remember or not even have heard of Chi. It's, uh, it's difficult to remember. It's 14 years in August since Chi died. Um, and I'd commend to you the Plas Lives of the Fellows for his obituary. These are the English College does some excellent obituaries. And Chi was an understated, humble superstar of endovascular treatment, and he realized there were some deficiencies in EVAR, but he took them to the most extreme end and treated patients with ruptures where he thought they would benefit the most. And this was before Improve, and I don't know if Janet will hear the data we had. And he took the very mo most difficult patients in Belfast and made a success of it. So my talk, I suppose, is a prequel to Tim's talk yesterday about innovation. So I'm going to take you from the beginning to where he started. And innovation in medical practice is often criticized. Um, this is Andreas Gunzig. The, the place is the American Heart Association in 1971. And he was there to try and get interest in this newfangled thing he had, which would allow him to dilate coronary stenosis in dogs. In the end, a disgruntled Gunzig left before the end of the meeting because no one had listened to him. And the epitaph of the meeting was this. History now remembers it as the beginning of the global industry, which is PCI. So there's always suspicion. And surgical innovation over the last two years, we moved from extra cavity or open surgery through to intracavity or laparoscopic mainly surgery to the holy grail really of intraluminal and it's probably urology and vascular that have taken that to the nth degree and gone intraluminal. Um, but the, perhaps the biggest parallel in the UK at least where a common operation changed almost overnight was lap coli. And lap coli, even though the approach was different, it still actually took the gallbladder out. But what it didn't do is leave the gallbladder sac in situ and put a sort of stent inside to exclude the stones. Stay with me. Now, for any innovation, there has to be a driver for change. And actually, we had big drivers for change because in the UK, at least, lots of aortic surgery was being done by so-called general vascular surgeons who often did breast surgery as well. Uh, they were done in low volumes in many district general hospitals. Vascular anesthesia hadn't really been invented. It was just done by the sort of bravest or the most stupid vascular anesthetists. And there was no real cardiorespiratory CPET, nothing like that. 
and very, very poor uptake of statins and antiplatelets. So not surprisingly, these patients didn't do very well. And the next thing you need for drivers for change, you need new technology, you need industry involvement, and you need a new idea. And Juan Parodi had been working on a new idea to fix the aorta from the inside, actually since the mid-70s. And this was his concept. It didn't really get anywhere till his friend Palmaz brought out this. And we forget, really, with all our stents available today, how revolutionary the Palmaz stent was. And we credit Parodi in 1990 for the first EVA, but he actually, he wasn't the first. So this man was the first. This is Nicholas uh, Volodos, who was working on the sort of western fringes of the USSR in a place we'd now sort of call Ukraine. Um, and he was the first, and this is the article in 1988, which described his device and putting it in a patient with an aneurysm. What is interesting about this, if you take away some of the sort of lack of pizzazz that Eastern Bloc pictures show at that time, that isn't terribly different 35 years ago from the devices we're now using. Think on that. We didn't know really how to assess these patients, so we used the same outcome metrics that we used for open surgery. And this was an era before the National Vascular Database, which was the precursor of the NVR, audit MDT. But we did have an m and and there was some peer pressure, and there was quite a bit of criticism. I think Tim also mentioned this a failed experiment. So Jack Collin and John Movey were the, the, the then editors of the BJS, and they wrote a cutting but very articulate editorial saying that actually EVA wasn't going to work. The usual suspects commented, uh, and the comments you know, wrote much more uh, manuscript than the actual editorial, um, and we thought they were hopelessly old-fashioned, but I'd recommend going back to have a little read of that with today's insights. We did the sensible thing, though. We put patients in registries, and Eurostar was the first registry, a European-wide registry. And it's interesting, there are some sage comments from this, and the two things that it established was that EVA worked, but it didn't do very well in people who had big sacs, and it didn't do very well in people who had wide necks. We sort of haven't really learned those lessons. But we went one better, and we actually got evidence, and all credit to... Roger and Janet, uh, the EVAR trials were groundbreaking and they randomized patients between open surgery and EVAR. And lo and behold, they told us exactly what our prejudice was saying. At this time, we all had pictures of a patient having had open surgery in ITU, tubed a lot of lines, and a guy who'd had EVAR sitting up, drinking a cup of tea with a pretty nurse next to them. And this was a success. And this showed us that EVAR 30-day mortality was 1.7% and open surgery was 4.7%. And that was sustained, that 3% difference, out to four years. Success. It's better. We know it's better. Fantastic. We did see in the lower curve, you can see that, yes, there were 40% complications and 21% re-interventions, but we were absolutely convinced newer devices would abolish those it's a winner. And we had proof from the rest of Europe and Australia and New Zealand. You can see that EVAR patients did better. Now, this is the infamous Vasconet data, which showed, amongst other things, that actually one thing we weren't very good at in the UK was open aortic surgery, with a mortality of about 8%. And if you looked at the vascular anesthetist data, it was probably close to 10% across the country. And this was poor. But if you look what happened over the subsequent 10 years, as the percentage of EVAR rose, the mortality came down. Now, was this because it's sort of harder to kill someone with EVAR compared to open surgery? Or were there other things to play? And there were some other things to play. The smoking era continued to decline. We know that patients were probably getting a bit fitter and healthier, and the aortic size was reducing. And we also know that the Vascular Society looked at those figures and thought they look horrible, and they put in place one of the first quality improvement programs, which was very, very successful. 
And it stopped small volume centers doing cases. It brought around uh, regionalization and networks and improved uh, outcomes. And at the same time, industry were producing better and better devices. Now, I'm going to mention lots of different companies here, so I'm not picking on anyone. I've only got this here because this is what I deem the classical IFU. So this is a 15 millimeter proximal neck, a size no greater than 32 millimeters, and a 60, less than a 60 degree angle. And that's what we typically know about an IFU. And it's fair play. If you design and produce a device, you tell people what are the constraints and how you can use it. You don't expect people to abuse that and use it how they like. But as devices got better, easier to deploy, more accurate to deploy, imaging got better, we went from CTs with about 16 small pictures on, on celluloid to uh, a massive picture on a screen, we got braver. And I remember this very meeting, people in the bar saying, hmm, deployed on nine millimeters last week. Completion energy was perfect. And someone else said, seven, you know. And it was boasting about how, how, how small the proximal seal zone was. And the first sort of shock wave came with the Shanza paper in 2011. And this told us three things. And this was at a time when I think everyone thought, actually, open surgery was going to finish. Eva was going to take over everything. And this showed in 10,200-odd patients in the U.S. that 42% were outside of IFU. At five years, 41% still had an increasing sac. And also the newer devices in red, at the bottom right, performed more poorly than the older devices in blue. So that was a bit of a blow. And subsequently, we've had evidence all about outside of IFU and adverse neck, proximal neck technology, showing that those cases do worse in times of in terms of type 1A endoleak, early ruptures, and death. And I like this paper because I quite like the JBS cartoons because it's quite simple to look at. But this is really interesting because we know that patients outside of IFU tend to be worse patients. They tend to have bad anatomy and they tend to have bad hearts and they, do, they just do worse. But what is interesting here is you would think if you put in a device outside of IFU, the main failure would be a device-related failure, which would lead to an increase in aortic-related mortality. It makes sense, doesn't it? But that's not the case here. There was also all-cause mortality seems to be a benefit in the open surgery. And this is just 200 patients in each arm, not randomized, but cohort matched. And this either means one thing is we as clinicians can pick winners and we choose patients, even though the demographics look similar, that we think will do better from open surgery and they do better. Or there's something about what you do to the sac in open surgery which is missing from endovascular and that confers some sort of benefit from cardiovascular mortality. I'll come back to this when we look at the UK Compass um, results. So it's not the economy, it's the IFU. And worse than that, the Great Registry, which is looking at 10-year follow-ups of GO-Excluder, showed that even within what we know as that conservative IFU, the larger the size of the proximal neck, the worse the outcome. And that now tells us that over 25 millimeters in maximal diameter of the proximal neck, there is an increase in type 1A endoleak, rupture, and death. And that really does make sense because if you're putting a 36 millimeter device into a 32 millimeter diameter, if we scan that patient as part of aneurysm screening and we said their aorta was 32 millimeters, we call it a small aneurysm and put them in a surveillance group because we know it's going to get bigger and become a big aneurysm. Well, if that's your seal zone, that's not great. So it does make sense. Now, I worry now that we're sort of relearning some lessons here because we know that patients within IFU do better. If you shift the goalposts and you say the new IFU is 10 millimeters, by whatever means, whether they're adjuncts or whether they're new devices, 
that doesn't necessarily translate into better results. We really don't know what will happen then. But what we do know is even if you put a device in well deployed, well planned within IFU, in up to 30% of patients, the aortic neck does dilate. And whether that's radial force or whether it's degeneration of the aorta, we don't know, but it does happen. And we also know that the seal zone is really important. And I like this paper because I've always had a problem with saying on the preoperative CT that there's a 15 millimeter neck, so you're in IFU, but you don't actually get, you don't attain that 15 millimeter neck when you deploy it. So what you really should do is look at the first postoperative CT and decide whether you're in IFU, i.e. how much of that did you uh, actually attain, and that diagram shows that. And I think that's something, a lesson we haven't learned as well. Amongst all these devices, they all really Me Too devices, evolutions of other devices. The only disruptor here was EVAS. So the Nelix device from Endologics was the only one that looked at trying to treat the sac. Now, we know what happened to that, and we know that they fell out. But there's something we should still learn from sac management. And during this time, patients were actually getting fitter. They had their colon cancer treated, they'd had their coronaries treated, they were living longer, they were taking their best medical therapy. And life expectancy increased nearly eight years in sort of three or four decades. And this is just at the time in our MDTs we were seeing larger and larger sacs with EVAR sitting in them. And I thought I had the largest earlier this year at 15.5 and then Celia beat me with 16.4 last month. You know, we were all seeing problems in our MDTs. And the final EVAR results actually showed that the lines did cross at seven years. And as time went on, the EVAR group did worse in terms of aneurysm-related mortality, and the open group prevailed. The numbers at risk are small. This is old data now, but it's randomized data, and it's important. We began to see it in other areas as well. Again, cohorted match data showing that EVAR patients didn't do quite, they did well up to three years, and after that, patients with open surgery were doing better. So, should we go more proximally? Is the answer to do more and more fever? And um, I'm grateful for, to Gustavo for these pictures. You can't but credit him because his pictures are so lovely, so you could never get away with showing them. And this is, we don't need to rehearse the history of fever, but we have now got many, many more devices uh, than the Zenith from Cook. And it does allow a proximal seal zone, a more proximal seal zone, which is a good thing because we know histologically the aorta changes as you become more proximal. But there is a bit of a cost because it is more complex, it's more expensive, you're covering a larger area, and there are more in re-interventions. And there are some aspects which mean that you can't do EVA, but also apply to fever or make it a bit more difficult. And it really does depend on the patient. We don't really have much good data beyond five years with FIVAR. This is uh, Tom Astrachi's paper, which is 12-year results. It's not quite 12-year results. It doesn't quite tell us that. But this describes Roy Greenberg's era at the Cleveland, where arguably they were the best in the world at this. And if you look at that bottom curve, I haven't got a pointer, but the blue curve at the bottom, that is the four FEN data out to five years, and only 20% of those patients were alive at five years. Now, the paper you know, says that this wasn't aortic-related mortality. Well, yes, fine, but it's still mortality. And the purpose of aneurysm exclusion is to allow people to live longer. So this is arguably a failure of a patient around a really good device, but either way, it's probably not good uh, patients of choice here. Yeah. And quality of life is important. This is one of the first early papers from 2006 which looked at quality of life after EVA, and it showed that out to uh, six weeks there was a big benefit compared to open surgery. But interestingly, by six months, the open surgical group had a better quality of life. And the latest paper, from yesterday in fact, Bijan Astoli abstract, shows us a very similar thing, a benefit to six weeks, 
But then by six months, not so much different. So coming finally to UK Compass, um, I did give Colin the slides for the debate yesterday, but he couldn't use them because he'd argued the wrong side of a debate, so he had to change his, change his mind. Um, this was a two-year study looking at all cases. So people who go around saying, oh, my cases weren't included. This was all cases in the UK taken from HES and NVR of aneurysms repaired in a two-year block, 9,000 patients, and then we excluded uh, standard EVR, thorough abdominal, everything, and got to 3,500, which were so-called off-label or complex uh, inferenal cases. And what's interesting is, first thing is, there were more off-label, 3,500, than on-label, 3,000. And they were propensity matched, so this was not randomized data, into a number of groups. And just some take-home messages. So if you look at the perioperative death rate, it was utterly predictable. The open surgical group would do worse than fever than EVAR. But what was interesting here, this is a, at least a third of these were uh, suprarenal clamps. They were all patients who were uh, adverse anatomy. Actually, those mortality figures are pretty good. And those are pretty comparable in any era. The next thing which wasn't so surprising is freedom from later interventions was better with open surgery um, than EVAR and then FIVAR. So most of the re-interventions re for FIVAR. I was a little bit surprised there were so many so early, but that's what it showed. The big shock was that curve, which is all-cause mortality. And the first thing is the lines crossed really early, which was hard to understand. And the more difficult thing, FIVAR with a more proximal seal followed EVAR. We know EVAR shouldn't have been used here anyway, but they both did badly and they both did badly quicker than we expected. And that's hard to understand why, whether it's something to do with a SAC, or despite the propensity matching, as clinicians, we chose winners for open surgery and they lasted longer. So more, more to come from that. Now, um, I thought Andrew would be still in the audience. I know he's got his basil hat on, but he's gone. But this very society debated the nice draft guidelines and the big problem I had with it is it excluded any patient from having EVAR. And I, and I couldn't accept that because we know many patients do benefit. But actually, there were lots of sensible things within the NICE guidelines. And looking back on them, I suspect we'll finally come to realize there was perhaps more sense than less sense. So in conclusion, EVAR was a genius solution. The, the innovation was really rapid, and industry was a very, very important partner here. The basic principles seemed really good, and the outcomes, at least initially, were demonstrably better. It was, it was magical. And patients benefited from this. Patients loved it. Now, the concept remains really good. I think innovation has slowed. I, I think we've just evolved devices rather than actually thinking what's the problem. I think we have had some failures. I think, yes, Nelix, very visible one, but actually the low profile, drive for low profile, I think has been a, a failure. And I think we've tried to actually go for applicability um, rather than durability. I think that basic principle of leaving a big sack may be flawed, as the longer term outcomes are now not better, and not all patients have benefited. So, EVAR works really well in a proportion of patients, and those proportion are within standard IFU, with a smaller proximal neck diameter, clean landing zones, smaller sac sizes. Unfortunately, that proportion of patients is smaller than we'd hoped, and we've got to accept that. We can't apply it to everyone. We've gone for applicability in instead of durability, and I think we've neglected sac management. Now, are the glory days over? Well, I'm not sure. I think the naive, optimistic days are over. What's certainly not over is the paydays, because in the Western world, aneurysms may be decreasing, but actually, in India and China, there's going to be a massive increase, and this is a US projected market. That's in billions, by the way, and the global projected market. So my, 
I suppose the homework, I think, for industry is to spend some of that on R&D to try and improve <coughs> durability. And our homework is to actually look at which patients will benefit and concentrate on those patients to get better outcomes rather than sort of diluting the name of EVAR by using it inappropriately. Thank you very much.